we see images like this, we hear stories about refugees in our news almost every day. But there are some parts of the story that we don't hear as often. Several years ago, I met a young refugee very much like this young man shown here. I'll call him Jeno. He was 20 when I met him. When he was 10, he fled the civil war in his home country, Liberia. So he'd been a refugee for half his life. We were in Egypt at the time, and as a refugee in Egypt, Jeno couldn't go to school, he couldn't work, he couldn't take any steps to rebuild his life. Instead, he was just stuck in limbo. And yet he had three different volunteer jobs. So I asked him one day why he was doing this, why he was working so hard, not even getting paid. And I thought he was going to tell me, other people helped me, and I'm giving back. But instead, he looked me in the eye, and he, and he said, someday, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to be someplace where they let me work, and I'm going to need a resume. I'm building my resume. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jeno's story is not at all unique. And that's why I'd like to ask you all here today to walk away remembering three numbers. The first is 21 million. The next is less than 1%. And the last is 26 years. So what do these numbers mean? There are 21 million refugees in the world today. These are people who have fled war or targeted violence against them because of something about them their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, their political opinion. Less than 1% of these refugees reach and resettle in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand combined each year. That means the vast majority of refugees are in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and Latin America. About half of these refugees are in what's called protracted refugee situations. This is defined as a situation where at least 25,000 people have been displaced from a single country for a minimum of five years. The average time in a protracted situation, the average time that a protracted situation lasts today is 26 years. Think about that for a minute. Now, about half of the world's refugees are in camps. These are essentially internment camps in almost every country where they exist. Refugees are not allowed to leave. They're confined behind barbed wire. Think about where this little girl will be in 26 years if she's living behind that barbed wire. The other half of refugees live predominantly in urban areas. And like Jeno, the refugee in Egypt, they're typically not allowed to work or attend school or open a bank account, rent an apartment, take the steps that you and I would consider fundamental to rebuilding our lives. And the reasons for this are complex. But our current solution for refugees doesn't solve this problem. Almost all of our refugee assistance today particularly the refugee assistance going to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, is humanitarian aid, food, and tents, and blankets. And this is absolutely critical on day one, when a refugee first comes across a border from a war zone. She needs some place to sleep that night. She needs food to eat that day. But it shouldn't be our answer 26 years later. So how do we move beyond aid to a more sustainable solution? It starts by understanding that refugees are not just people with needs, but also people with rights. 147 countries have agreed to let refugees move freely and access education and take part in the labor market. And when refugees can do this, they can meet their own needs. They can rebuild their own lives. <laughs> 
I work with refugees all over the world. And all over the world, refugees tell me that one set of rights in particular is fundamental. Refugees tell me, if I could only work, everything else would be better. And in a certain way, this is obvious, right? If you can work, you have money, you can provide for yourself. But work means that and much more. Work allows you to be a responsible parent, to provide for your children. Work gives you purpose and a reason to get up in the morning. Work gives you the ability to make choices about your life. If you're dependent on aid and you're given a bag of rice, you're eating rice for dinner. If you work and earn a salary, you get to decide what you're having for dinner that night. One refugee in Ecuador said, to have work is to have life. I was part of the first global study of barriers to refugee employment and entrepreneurship around the world. We looked at a sample size of 15 countries, home to 30% of the world's refugee population. So you'll remember that I told you that the world's refugee population is 21 million, and that less than 1% resettle in countries like the US. So the vast majority of refugees remain in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. And in our study, we found that about half of the countries surveyed completely barred refugees from working. Their laws prohibited refugees from working, providing for themselves, contributing to the economy. In most of the rest of the countries, there wasn't a legal prohibition to working, but there were significant barriers that made it almost impossible for refugees to work. So for example, in Tanzania, Tanzania doesn't say that refugees can't work, but it does have a law saying refugees have to live in refugee camps in the remote western region of the country. Makes it pretty hard to find a job. So what do we do about this? How do we move from dependence on aid to a world where in any country, refugees can rebuild their lives, work, contribute? How do we get to that world? How do we get to those countries? Our study suggested that there are two missing pieces of the puzzle that can complement our current solutions of humanitarian aid. The first is to have the right laws, right? If we want refugees to be able to work, feed their families, rebuild their lives, and contribute to their new communities, we need laws that let them work and feed their families and rebuild their lives and contribute to their new communities. We need those laws in place in any country where a refugee is. And the second big piece is we need to recognize the economic contributions of refugees. Oxford did a study in Uganda that showed that when Uganda let refugees work, the refugees who started businesses and hired other people, 40% of them hired Ugandans, even a few short years after this law was put in place. Here in our own country, the US, another 40%, 40% of our Fortune 500 companies were started by refugees and immigrants or their kids. When we recognize that refugees contribute to an economy, when we recognize that refugees aren't just rebuilding their own lives, but also improving all of ours, we have the political will and the drive to put in place the laws that make this possible. So what do we need to do to put these laws in place? I'll offer four suggestions. The first, is we need to fund advocacy, right? Right now, almost all of our dollars and time in refugee response goes to humanitarian aid. We need to also invest in long-term solutions, and that means investing in people who can change the laws, right? Laws don't just change by themselves. They need people pushing to change those laws. So we need to invest in advocacy. Second, we need to invest in locals. I work with advocates in several countries who've been successful at getting their countries to commit to put in place the laws that let refugees work, that make it easier for refugees to access employment, 
rebuild their lives, and contribute to their new countries. And what all these advocates have in common is that they're locals of the country in which they're advocating. Right? They've got skin in the game. They've got credibility. They know how the system works. They're able to say, this is my country, and this is what I want to see here. Today, very little refugee response funding goes to locally led organizations, but we can change that. The third thing we need to do is to, is to support these local advocates by ensuring that we're playing our part outside of the country. Powerful actors from the outside can create incentives for countries that do a good job with this, that let refugees work. One example is the World Bank. They've already made some of their loans contingent on a country letting refugees work. That's a great start, and we need to do more of that. And finally, we need to facilitate labor migration, both within countries where refugees live, so that a refugee can move where the jobs are, can fill gaps in the job market, and also across borders, so that if Brazil needs doctors, and a doctor from Democratic Republic of Congo is a refugee in Tanzania, she can make that transition to go where the jobs are, to meet the needs, to contribute to another country and to contribute to our world. If we do that, refugees like Geno, with that drive and determination to walk, work three different volunteer jobs just to be ready for his chance, refugees like him will no longer be waiting for their opportunity. They'll be seizing it. And when they do so, all of us will benefit. <laughs>